Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Welcome to the Ransom Heart Podcast. This is Craig McConnell. And uh, as uh, you may know, we began our last podcast doing a, a series of uh, cutting up, segmenting a, an interview that we did with Michael Kusick of uh, Restoring the Soul Ministries. And you can find out more about Michael, his ministry of working with men and leaders and um, by going to RestoringTheSoul.com. We thought it was such a good interview, we wanted to offer it on our website, as he does on his. So, hope you enjoy this uh, conversation, and um, I think you'll enjoy this interview. We're meant to be God's regents in the world. We're meant to bring the abundance and the authority and, yes, the holiness and morality and all of it of God's kingdom into our kingdoms and that through the authority of Jesus. You know, I was just going to add something there, um, Michael, as well, that, um, you know, God's design for us as image bearers, um, what thwarted um, his design from being fulfilled and being realized? Uh, We're quick to say that's sin. Um, And Scripture points out how the heart of man is desperately wicked, who can know it. And the problem we have had as people is, is sin. Uh, the problem is our heart. Our heart doesn't turn to God. Uh, we turn to other gods, other idols, so on and so forth. So the promise of the Old Testament and the anticipation of Christ's coming also include this new covenant where we would get a new heart, God's law would be written in our heart, there'd be a new spirit. And so one of the benefits as well of the gospel that somehow has gotten lost or doesn't um, that seems to be assaulted is is actually one of the benefits of the gospel is we're new creatures in Christ. Mm. We have new hearts. And, and the hope we have is that all that Scripture uh, kind of portrays is our life. We can actually have because I actually can be merciful mm. with a pure, a good heart. I can actually love. I'm not... I'm not stuck with a depraved heart as a believer in Christ. Mm-hmm. I've been changed. And so the life that's described, the, the life uh, that we're to bear as image bears is actually possible mm. to live. Mm. So this idea of Jeremiah 17, 9, where people reflexively say, you know, well, I, I just have a wicked heart. I can't trust myself. That's really not true for the believer in Christ. Well, it's immensely true before Christ. Yeah, no uh, doubt. But I need to point out that that passage is spoken in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. I mean, you just think about the redemption of mankind. God knows the heart's the problem. It's Jesus true. says it's not what goes into the mouth of man, right, but what comes out of his heart. You know, murder, adultery, all of that. God knows the heart's the problem. Do you think that he would neglect to address the deep issues yes. of the heart in yeah. his intentions to produce a genuinely holy race of people. You can't. You can't neglect the heart if you want genuine holiness. And so, you know, Paul says, for example, in Romans 2, that your heart has been circumcised to God. He says a Jew is not a, one outwardly. A true Jew is inward. It's a matter of the heart. And he says circumcision is, is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower and the seed. Uh, he says, but the seed that fell on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart. I mean, it just this sounds like heresy to say these things, but they're deeply, deeply scriptural. And they, they make sense as well. Uh, Acts chapter 15, it says that God purified our hearts by faith. On and on it goes. In fact, you just take the example, just put wicked heart, put your wicked heart into any of the admonitions given in the New Testament, right? Singing and making melodies in your wicked heart to God. You know, love one another sincerely from your wicked heart. You know, uh, <laughs> where your treasure is, there your wicked heart will be. You know, I mean, just it's absurd. It's, it's, it's patently absurd, but this is another example of an impoverished gospel crippling people to live the life that they desperately want to live mm-hmm. and that the Scripture says you can live. Well, you can live it if you've got a new heart. Yeah. I've not heard a whole lot of sermons on the New Covenant or the Good Heart. Craig, as a pastor for 30 years at two megachurches, why do you think that is? 
Oh, well, I didn't believe it at that. I didn't. I mean, this is for 30 years. I I preached um, a gospel that appealed to people um, volitionally to choose, believing that if that there was some strength and choice to follow God and to do what's right and to pick uh, love over adultery, so on and so forth. Um, but I never grappled with the reality that throughout the week, all my counseling, um, I wasn't addressing the real issue. It's, it's not volitional. It's, it's on the level of the heart that needs to be addressed. I wasn't trained that way in seminary. I wasn't... Uh, I was surrounded by pastors who, who uh, commonly believe the heart's wicked and depraved, and and our job is to scold and pressure, manipulate, and uh, shame people into some point of guilt where they actually might be motivated to change their lives, and it never lasts. Hmm. Um, so the, the gospel of sin management yeah. that Willard talks about, Craig, how did that affect you in your own heart? as a pastor, caregiver, minister? Well, early in my life, um, it was disillusioning. Coming out of seminary, I thought I'd change the world, you know, with uh, just my presentation of the gospel, that people would jump at an opportunity to be free and that I had some gift or calling or ability to help them make that leap. Um, Then I got distracted by being a part of a megachurch and just the whole idea of being a a part of this massive organization, and I got distracted by just keeping it running. Real change, real transformation wasn't a part of our model. And eventually, uh, that had an effect on me. I lost my heart hmm. for a couple of decades. I was just a sin management guy. What did that look like when you lost your heart? Well, to hear what John is talking about in terms of an intimacy with God, to talk about a conversational intimacy with God, to talk about worship where you'd actually fall on your knees and sing and adore him, to be moved to tears by um, people's stories and battles and victories, that was absent. Mm -hmm. Um, Heartless, just kind of flat-lined, not experiencing great joy nor experiencing great grief, just numb, just dead. This all begs a question. How did you get your heart back? Well, a quote I've doctored up with my own personal (laughs) thoughts. Um, Some old church father said, um, don't tell men to go into the woods, chop down trees, make lumber, and build ships. Don't do that. Instead, tell them stories of the sea. And in telling men stories of the sea, you capture their heart, and guess what they do? They go into the woods, chop down trees, make lumber, build ships. And I think John and other voices uh, were men who, through their stories, through their teaching, painted stories of the sea for me. And uh, I moved from, from trying to build ships to desperately wanting the sea and whatever I could do, whatever it would take to get there. So it's it's... Pictures and images of life, the ocean, freedom, adventure, beauty that were painted to me by John, by other authors that pulled me out of it. Hmm. I wanted to return to the sea. Hmm. And you got your heart back. Uh, Yeah, yeah, that's what, over time, that's what happened. And here at Ransom Heart, as you teach this message of the gospel and the good heart and the new covenant, you have what you call the four streams, which are the four different ways that Christ ministered to people. And that's how you you uh, bring people along in holiness. Can you talk about the four streams, John? Yeah. I'm deeply passionate about seeing people walk with God, discover a genuine holiness, find the transformation they're after. And so I went through a graduate program in counseling, became a counselor, and got in the office with people. And there is nothing like reality. <laughs> To show you, uh, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. It's the simplest, most helpful test I have used ever since. 
you shall know them by their fruit. You can hold that up to a book, a movement, a philosophy, a methodology of counseling, anything. A person does this work for heaven's sake. Hmm. Does it actually heal the broken heart and set the captive free? Does it produce genuine holiness? Does it this real lasting transformation take place? Okay, so with that search in mind, where we ended up was going back through the Gospels, looking at church history, finding out, okay, so how does God work in people's lives in lasting ways? What works? I just want to know what works. And so out of that, the four streams, meaning counseling, yes. You see Jesus do that with people. Discipleship, yes, absolutely. But also deliverance, um, being set free from from the evil one in various ways, and then inner healing, the actual Isaiah 61 uh, imagery. Because when Isaiah uses that, by the way, that brokenhearted, if you go back through Isaiah, it's not a metaphor. He doesn't use that particular Hebrew word metaphorically. He uses it literally. Elsewhere, it's a statue falling on the ground and breaking. It's a branch being broken. Literal brokenness takes place within human souls. You just have to you know, talk to someone pushing a shopping cart down the street for five minutes to realize that deep, deep brokenness takes place in the human soul. How does God heal that? That's what I want to know. What works? How do you really bring lasting change? And so that led us into the four streams, the teaching people how to tap into the ways in which God transforms lives. Because I'm telling you, discipline does not do it. Yeah. There's a place for discipline in the Christian life, but discipline does not heal people. It doesn't transform them. It doesn't set them free from spiritual bondage, wickedness, that sort of thing. For example, let me just take a quick example. Someone comes into our office and and uh, struggling deeply with depression, and uh, you know we we try the conventional means uh, of dealing with that sort of talk therapy combined with Christian discipleship, you know the truth of the Word of God, and making sure that they're practicing the spiritual disciplines and <clears throat> and, and doing what they can to get out of this hole that they're in. It doesn't work. So we pause and ask, well, why? What else is going on here? Well, we find out that through certain practices in their childhood, they had opened themselves up to dark spirits, uh, that there was spiritual oppression here. And this is actually normative in Scripture. Again, you know, Paul in Ephesians 4, do not let the sun go down while you're angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. He's speaking to Christians, and he's saying, as a Christian, you can give the devil strongholds in your life footholds. And believe me, he'll take them. Peter in 1 Peter 5 describes him as a ravenous lion looking for those he can destroy, not just tempt, destroy. And so we suddenly realize that the the stream of discipleship or the stream of counseling is not helping this depressed person. What we actually have in operation here are um, spiritual bondages, darkness, uh, foul spirits present. And so those need to be dealt with, you know, as Christ teaches us to deal with them. For example, in the wilderness, bringing the truth against it, banishing it, you know, buying the strong man Jesus teaches, then you can plunder his house, those kinds of things. Uh, Colossians 1, 13, God has ransomed us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his son. So learning to pray for people and teaching them to pray for themselves to shut down spiritual darkness, all of a sudden this person's well. Hmm. And they haven't been well for 10 years. And they're telling us, I've been to everybody. I've tried everything, and nothing worked. And that's where we began to realize, right, because you went and you got one stream. You know, you got counseling or, or you got discipleship, but you didn't get the fullness of, of of the four streams that we think are essential for restoring people in a lasting way. One of our core kind of mottos here or passions is irreversible change. Hmm. Irreversible change. I don't want inspiration. Hmm. I'm so done with inspiration. I, mm-hmm. I used to be that kind of guy and, and used to preach those kinds of messages. Motivation. Inspiration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really for Jesus. It doesn't last. <laughs> it doesn't last. And it's done with a deep, sincere heart. I mean, I thought that that, that would, what would be helpful to people. It doesn't work. I want irreversible change. And so we kind of unpack these things of, you know, how does God bring inner healing t- to people? You know, how do you deal with spiritual oppression? You know, how do you find a genuine discipleship with Jesus that's not just, you know, routine? And, and then what does, what you know, the counseling ministry of the Holy Spirit look like to us? You know that old saying, Michael, the only tool you have is a hammer. The world looks like a nail. Yeah. And, I mean, you just can't approach the complexity of some of our deep personal issues with just one tool. And you don't see that in the Gospels. Right, right. Well, that was our 
second of uh, four segments of an interview. And uh, our next podcast will be, obviously, number three. Hope you join us for that. And, of course, we invite you to find out more about what we've got going, what we're offering, some of our resources. And uh, you can find out more about us and what's going on by going to RansomHeart.com. 